Good morning. It's good to be with you. I was gone last week. Some of you know that. I want to really thank all of the elders for carrying the weight uh, so that whenever I need to be gone, need, need to take a little time off, I don't worry. Uh, and especially I want to thank Billy Gars and Pastor Billy last week. He, uh, he carried the, the weight of, of, of the preaching. You know, the two most important things that we do as your elders, this comes out of the Bible, this isn't my opinion, uh, are, are the ministry of, of the word and the ministry of prayer. We preach and we pray for you. We do a lot of other things. Um, make sure the bills get paid and make sure that the lights are on and make sure that things get fixed when they're broken. But if we miss those two things as your, as your elders, then we really have, have missed the target. And so we pray much for you. And we, we ho hopefully administer the word to you on a regular basis well. So anyway, thank you to the elders and especially to Billy for doing that. Uh, that, that, that. That meant the world to me and my family as we were able to be away. We are in the book of Genesis. We have been for about a year. We've taken a few breaks for some topical series. And we've taken some breaks for things like Christmas uh, and Easter. But uh, believe it or not, we're going to be done with the book of Genesis uh, in, in about a month and a half. We're going to be done in August. And, and the rest of our time uh, in the book of Genesis, we're going to be looking at the life and times of probably the most well-known character out of the book of Genesis, uh, and that is Joseph. Uh, and today is our first peek, our first look at Joseph. But what we're really going to be doing is looking more at his dad, than we are at Joseph himself. In coming weeks, we'll really drill down deep and really look, look hard at the life of Joseph. Today, we get the first peak. You know, as I look at people on the streets these days, and what I specifically mean by that, uh, when, I, when I drive down the streets and I see what we might call a panhandler, or as I, as I walk around the corner uh, on some busy street and I'm faced with uh, run into um, a, a shopping cart homeless person. As I encounter those types of people, uh, more and more these days, m more than ever, in fact, uh, I can imagine myself being in their shoes. I don't mean I'm being super empathetic and I'm feeling what they feel. What I mean is I can imagine myself ending up there. As a middle-aged man, more and more these days, I think on mental health and I think on dysfunction and I see people that I used to probably judge. And now I think more and more, man, I can imagine how you get there. I can imagine being like that. I guess what I'm saying is I have a, a sense more than ever of how dysfunction embeds itself in a person's life beyond their control. I, I preached on dysfunction, the brokenness that we have in us that might be related to sin but isn't necessarily sin by any means. I, I preached on dysfunction, that brokenness in us a few weeks ago, and it, it struck a chord with several of you. I know that because you've told me that. You told me that in confidence, and I'm not going to share your stories. But I think we were all able to really relate a couple of weeks ago. And so I want to go a little further down that road today and kind of address what the remedy, what, what the cure is. What's Jesus' perspective on our brokenness on our dysfunction. So when we're talking about dysfunction and the gospel, the story of Jesus, how it relates. Your dysfunction, your brokenness, the, the things that you do that, that you're embarrassed by and you don't think anybody else knows about, the things that you hide and cover from other people. And again, I'm not necessarily talking about sin. In fact, I'm, I'm mostly not talking about sin, but... but uh, I, 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 went through a, I went through this period, several months, it was years ago, where 
I was responsible for locking up a building and I would lock the building and then I would go and I would get in the car and then I would have to go check the lock. And then I would come back and I would get in the car again. And then I would I have to do it like three times. And I thought, I'm losing my, I'm losing my mind. Like what in the world is wrong with me? So I said to myself, I, I'm, I, I'm losing my mind. I, I'm going crazy. I, I have this dysfunctional pattern that I don't want anybody to know. Now I sit up here and tell you about it, but, but I, uh, but it's gone. I'm not doing that anymore. I've got my other my other junk that I won't share because it's too because <laughs> it's too it's too recent, right? But but we all have that stuff, that brokenness. There's this ongoing debate in 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 sociology. Are you the product of your upbringing, your life circumstances? Some might call that like victim mentality. Or on the other hand, are, are you are you just like the captain of your own ship? And you know, you're you're rather than, than being a victim of your upbringing, you are the product of a series of good choices, one choice after another, after another. And I wonder today. In fact, I'm going to more than wonder. We're going to address what is Jesus' perspective on that question. Do you just need to try a little harder and, and, and work a little more efficiently and, and, and make better choices? What's Jesus' perspective? What is the gospel's perspective on your, on your brokenness, on your dysfunction? It, 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 it hit home uh, this week when I started thinking about a funny little aspect of my childhood. And I, I talked to my mom. She's here today. I I asked her if I could share this story. It's lighthearted, but I think it's, I think it's telling. So here's my personal illustration. When I was a little boy, all of my childhood, really, um, my mother drove these really crappy cars, like these cars that were just like falling apart. And, and like, she didn't, she didn't have to, I don't know why she did. You can ask her later on, but, but she did. And, um, and I remember the embarrassment of driving into a parking lot where my friend's uh, parents had nice cars. And we, would, we wouldn't just drive in uh, in a way that didn't draw attention to ourselves, but rather we would, we would coast in with a blue, uh, a, a blue plume of smoke trailing behind us and the windows rolled down because the AC was broken, right? And so then we'd open up the creaky doors and get out sweaty and red-faced, you know, in the summertime. You can imagine what that's like. And I'm just a little chubby little boy who just doesn't want attention drawn to myself. But every day, that's, that's part of the deal. And, and the, the worst part is that the cars back then... I make myself sound ancient here, but the cars back then, we didn't have uh, fuel injection. We had carburetors. If you know what a carburetor is, I think more highly of you. Uh, but, but we had carburetors back then. I have, a motor, I have an old motorcycle. In fact, I think I have several motorcycles that have carburetors on them, not fuel injection. Uh, so, so, so the carburetor is, is, is an incredible mechanical device. Look it up sometime. It's just fascinating that someone was able to develop the carb carburetor. But it was a problem for me back in the late 70s and, and the, the um, early 80s uh, because it, it added to the pain of this the, the, the scene every morning. So I, we, would, we would coast into the parking lot, the blue flame. We would slam the doors because they didn't stay shut. And then we'd have to wait. We'd have to wait for it because the, the, the slow death of a motor, a carbureted motor, it, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't just turn off like a normal car. Like it would have to burn every drop of gas in the carburetor. So it'd go like, ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Ba -bum. And then finally, maybe 30 seconds later, it go, <laughs> And then the car would be turned off. But for 30 seconds, like, hey, Randy, your mom's car is still running. I'd like, shut up. And I'd, I would just hightail it into to school or whatever. Um, 
trying to run from my dysfunction. One time our car actually caught on fire and the, and the dumb neighbor the dumb neighbor called the fire department and the fire department showed up in like their full gear. And I was just so, so embarrassed as a child. And the worst, I talked to my mom about it, the worst, the, the best story, maybe I didn't even know this, but she used to, she used to take a coat, this part I knew, she used to take a coat hanger and, and, <laughs> and, and close her trunk because it wouldn't stay closed. And one time our family pet, unbeknownst to us, climbed into the trunk because it was kind of cracked open and, and went to school with my mom that day and he just got out and went under her desk and hung out that day. Uh, and, 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 and the thing, the thing that I would tell myself every morning, I bet, you, I bet you can relate to this. Every morning I would say to myself, when I'm an adult, I will never have an old car. When I'm an adult, I will always have cars that run well, and I, I, will, I, will, I will always buy new cars, and I will always maintain them. I will never put my kids through that. And guess what? <laughs> I've driven so many junky, so many broke down cars, jalopies, we used to call them in my life. I have a photo of, of it's, it's not the actual car that I had, but I had a car that was like almost identical to this. And I know it looks great and mine looked great, but it was actually a piece of work. It was actually, th this is a, this is a international harvester scout too. And I had one and it looked like this it was Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was like this, except mine didn't run real well. I had to I had to open the hood every morning uh, and take a long I'd put on a glove and then a long screwdriver and I would touch the the the, the post of the starter and the batters I'd have to touch two two things and then it would start up and one morning it was because you could start it and drive one morning I was I was outside of the hood and I started it and it was a cold December morning cold winter morning and I started it and it was in drive and it started running down the road and I had to chase <laughs> chase it down and open the door and jump in and we lived on a hill so that was quite a um, now I'm a grown man like with a full-time job you know but I, I still drive these things uh, one day after church in Albuquerque, Truett was about nine or ten at the time, and Truett drove home with me that day in this thing, and, and it died. We only lived like four or five miles from the church, but it died. Uh, it was on the side of the road, and three or four church families stopped and, and tried to help us get the thing started and push it, and Truett's friends were there, and he never, ever set foot in that truck again. He never got in that truck again. And a few months later, I sold it. And that was that. I broke the sincere promise that I'd made to myself as a child that I'll never be like that. And I wonder, I mean, that's a fun example, but I wonder how many of those sorts of pacts you've made with yourself. Um, I wonder how many times in your past, in my past, we've tried to run from dysfunction. So I'll, I'll never be like that. I'll never be like him. I'll never be like her. I'll never, when I grow up, I'll never do that. Or I'll never do that again. And so what's the remedy? I mean, you, you, you would think that, you would think that, that if, if the remedy is, is making better decisions, you'd think that if, the remedy were, was, was more self-discipline or trying harder that, that we, in fact, wouldn't repeat the things that we see in front of us, and the things that seem to be so deeply embedded in our lives that it's almost like we have no control. What are we running from? We're running from this... This, this brokenness that we see, this, this, these tendencies that we hate. So what does Jesus say about our dysfunctions, our brokenness? That, that's what we're talking about today. Um, so 
So let me let me give you a little review of where we've been so far in the book of Genesis, because some of you uh, haven't been here before or you didn't hear the last sermon I preached. We've talked uh, we talked for a couple of weeks about Jacob, Jacob. You remember Jacob? Uh, Jacob was uh, the 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 uh, the son of Isaac. Abraham had Isaac um, and Isaac had had Jacob. Isaac actually had. Uh, He was the father of Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau were twins. Jacob and Esau were twins. And and, and Jacob was the the son that had the hurts and the hang-ups. He had had, uh, had daddy issues. He really wanted his dad to be the kind of dad that he could never be. Jacob really wanted Isaac to be a kind of dad that Isaac just wasn't capable of being. (laughs) He had daddy issues. His father, Isaac, preferred his twin brother over him. And so Jacob, uh, he left home at an early age, but he took his daddy issues with him. You remember that? He went to a foreign land, and and, and then he had well-documented daddy-in-law issues. So he went from having issues with his dad to having serious issues with his father-in-law. And he carried this baggage and he carried this this dysfunction with him wherever he went. His scoundrel father-in-law was always tricking him and always taking advantage of him. And, and, and And so life for Jacob was like a wrestling match. And you remember a couple of weeks ago, he actually wrestled with the Lord. And he held on to the Lord and he said to God, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And, and what became of that, you remember, the Lord blessed him. And the Lord uh, changed his name. And in changing his name, what the Lord was doing was changing his identity He changed his name to um, Israel. And then he was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's that's what his name was changed to, Israel. He had 12 12 sons. And, 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 And so Israel, Jacob, his, his dysfunction, his, his brokenness grew out of these, these daddy issues and then these father-in-law issues that he had. And, and so let me ask you, and then we're going to jump into the text and we're going to read today's Bible passage. But let me ask you, like, what do you think he told himself every day of his life? What you bet? What you bet? Every day of his life he said to himself, when I grow up, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna play favorites. When I grow up, I, I won't be like my dad. When I grow up, I won't be like my old man. When I have kids, I'm gonna treat them all the same. What you bet he said that? I mean, he's a new man with a new name and a new identity. The Lord is remaking him in the image of Christ. And 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 what you bet when he when he was going through all that, he said, "I'm gonna break it right now." Self-discipline. I won't have favorites. I won't pre- prefer one child over the other. I won't treat any one of them better than the others. I'm not going to be like that. I- I'm not going to be like my, my father-in-law. I'm not, not going to trick my kids. I'm not going to deceive my kids. I'm going to be honest with my children. So today, today we see his dealings with his children, and, and in particular, how he deals with Joseph. Remember Joseph in the story, the, the coat of many colors? Let's read that now. If you'll read along silently, I'll, I'll read out loud. Genesis chapter 37 it says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. Now remember, Jacob goes by another name. In fact, in this passage, he's going to be called both Jacob, also Israel. Same dude, same guy. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob, his his kids. Um, Joseph, being 17 years old, 
was pastoring the flock with his brothers, the other sons of Jacob. And he was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Okay, what's going on here? What this means is Joseph, uh, he's a 17-year-old spoiled brat jerk kid. And in the, in the original language, what's really being said here is that Joseph, uh, at the very least, he was being a tattletale, but quite possibly the nuance of the original language is saying that he made up stuff. Like he was, he was intentionally bringing a false and yet bad report of his, uh, regarding his brothers to his dad. Now, Israel, we've changed names now, but it's the same guy, Jacob, the dad. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. They, ha they hated Joseph. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Here's what he said. Here's how the dream went. He said, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf <clears throat> arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed uh, to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream, uh, behold, the sun, the moon, <clears throat> and 11 stars were bowing down to me. What's he saying? The, the, the sun and moon are his father and mother, and the 11 stars are his 11 brothers. He says, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father <clears throat> uh, and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow yourselves, bow ourselves to the ground before you? <clears throat> and his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, so what's going on here? Joseph is 17. Joseph is a jerk, left to himself. If nothing changes in life, and if you know the story of Joseph, things are about to change drastically, but, but if things don't change in Joseph's life, he's just going to repeat the pattern that has been passed down that's like it's running through his bloodstream. He's going to be just like his father, just like his grandfather, just like his great-grandfather. Um, and it is no wonder. He's clearly growing up a spoiled uh, a child, a favored child. He gets away with murder, sort of a child. And, and it would be easy for me to preach a sermon today, kind of a moral essay on, you know, you reap what you sow or how to raise. But I don't think that's the point. We'll, we'll get to Joseph in coming weeks, but, but what really jumps out at the page to me today is Jacob. The point is Jacob from his childhood didn't learn a thing. I have to believe that Jacob from his childhood said, I'm going to be better than that. I'm going to make better choices. I vow never to commit the sins of my father. And now he's grown up to be just like his dad. Plain favorites, just like his father. The big issue here is that the dysfunction in your life, the brokenness in your life, it's not a choice. 
We think it is, and we judge people who are more dysfunctional than us, like it's their fault and like we're okay because uh, we use them as a metric and we're better than them and so we're okay. The remedy to your dysfunction is not willpower. The, will, the, the remedy for your dysfunction is the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. The power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. The gospel of Christ. The grace of your heavenly Father. That's what we're talking about today. Try to answer this question. What does Jesus say about my dysfunction? The stuff that I hide. The stuff that I don't want anybody to know about. The, the weird idiosyncrasies that, that, that make up my life. The sin patterns that, that I see ruining my relationships. The, the brokenness that has been passed on. What does Jesus say about my dysfunction? Well, the first thing that he said, that I'm not the product of my own choices. Now, you have to understand what I mean by that. Fixing my brokenness is not, is not about me fixing myself. It's not about me making better choices. The, 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 the key to you fixing the, the brokenness in your life is not about you fixing yourself or you determining to be better uh, than past generations. Um, the, the key to, 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 to break strongholds, to, to changing patterns, to, is, is submitting my life to Jesus. You see, the, 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 the Christian ethic, the, 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 the truth of the Bible is this. We, every one of us in this room, we are born broken. Now, now the secular mind hates that it hates that teaching. And, and that's fine if you are a secularist. You don't have to embrace that. But if you are a Christian, which means that you follow the teachings of Jesus, that you submit your life to the teachings of Jesus. If you are a Christ follower, then you are obligated to believe the story of the Bible, which is this. That, that God created a, a perfect world. And Adam and Eve lived in total harmony uh, with God in the Garden of Eden. But then sin and brokenness and um, rebellion entered into the human race through Adam and Eve. And, and that all of existence was like a, a fine crystal goblet that, that, was, that was thrown violently to the, to, to, to the ground and, and shattered beyond recognition. And, and if that is us, if that is our, the, the brokenness of humanity as a whole, then, then there's nothing we can do about that. We can pick up the little shards and try and tape them together and glue them together, but it makes no difference whatsoever. We can't fix that. And, and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that is what Jesus is now doing. He is reclaiming all of that. He, he didn't just come to pay for your sins. He came to recl reclaim and redeem every aspect of who you are, every fiber of your being, to make it all new again, to, 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 to not just glue it back together, but to make it new. So when I say that I am not, you're not the product of your choices, my choices, what I mean is, it's a lie to say something like this. Well, my life is a terrible life, but I deserve it for what I've done. That's not the truth of the gospel. Another lie that you might speak if things are going particularly well for you right now might be, well, if everyone else would just be as disciplined, uh, get up as early as me and, 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 and work as hard as me, then... They would be successful like me. 
That may be true in your worldview, but that is not in line with, it's not in keeping with the teachings of Jesus. I've seen so many people who live in dysfunction and live in brokenness, and they experience this like brush with normalcy, like they experience normalcy for a moment. And I think, okay, well, now that they've tasted it, they're going to be just fine. Uh, and, and then they return to their dysfunction. And I'm forced to ask arrogant questions like, well, what are they, stupid? No, no. The, the, issue, the issue here is, is that every one of us, we are all sick. We are all sin sick. We are all in need of a Savior. And some of our sin, uh, some of our brokenness, some of our dysfunction is, is way more glaring and way more obvious and, 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 and way less well-adjusted by the the standards that, of the world that we live in. But the truth is, none of us can fix ourselves. Every one of us is broken. Every one of us needs a Savior. So before you throw rocks or, or before you judge the panhandler, um, realize that his dysfunction is really just an ugly picture of the secret dysfunction in my own life. And, and I'm not the product of my own choices. I'm... A broken man, born that way. The second, the second answer to this question, what does Jesus say about my dysfunction, is this, that as a Christ follower, I'm a new creation in Christ. You, if you're a Christ follower, if you have submitted to, your life to the teachings of Jesus. If you said, I, I'm going to follow Jesus as best I can, I'm going to, uh, when, when he says this, I'm going to do this. When he, go left, I'll go left. Go right, I'll go right. I'm going to follow. If that's you, then you are a recipient of a new nature. You are a recipient of God's grace. You are now in Christ, a new creation. You're not just taped back together. You're not, you're not just glued back together. You, you're not just recovering. You're a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that. It says, for the love of Christ controls us. This is what it means to be a Christ follower. If some of you are considering being a Christ follower, here's one of the, here's one of the great perks. There are several. Here's one of the great perks of being a Christ follower. For, for the love of Christ controls us because we have, we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. In other words, Jesus did it. He did it for us all. Um, verse 15, and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Verse 16 says this. I'm sorry, that was verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Now, this is the English standard version, and that's a little bit wordy. It's a good, it's a good, good translation of the Bible, but in the Holman Stand, uh, in, 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 in another, in another, stand, another version of the Bible, it says it, it's rather than saying, um, "From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh." It says this: "From now on, we we regard no one in a purely human way." Going on, even though we once regarded Christ in that way, according to the flesh. In, in a purely human way. We regard him thus no longer. You used to look at Jesus and say, ah, he's just a mere man. But now we're the church. This was written just, just after Jesus had ascended into. Like, now we're the church. Now we see Jesus in a totally different light. Paul's saying that's how we look at each other now. In a totally different light. Like, you used to look at you and be like, you're the product of your own sins. You're the product of your own decisions. You make your bed, you lie in it. You're just a human. But now I see you in a different light. Verse 
17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I'm skipping for the sake of time several verses which are really beautiful verses. I encourage you this afternoon to go, re go read all of it. Verse 21, it says, For our sake, Jesus, or God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. You, you're the righteousness of God. You are a new creation in Christ. In several of Paul's letters, he says, you know, we used to see each, see each other in an old way, like the way that your high school buddies know you, you know, or your reputation in your hometown, or how people think of you generationally. Like we used to look at each other and we, like, I know your baggage, uh, I know where you live, uh, I know, I know your, your family, and, I, and we, used to, we used to look at each other so judgmentally. And Paul says, but that's not how, that's not the way of the church. That's not how we do, that, that's not the culture that we want in the church now. And, I'm, and I mean in River Church. Like, we don't want that culture anymore. We don't want to look at each other and say, well, no wonder you turned out that way. Or, or, or no wonder you're doing that. You've always done that. Or, or, or you're just lazy, man. Uh, no, now, now we see in each other the light of Christ. We, we see each other through a different lens. We, we no longer see the worst in each other. We see Jesus in each other. You are meant to afford others that kind of grace as you have been afforded that kind of grace. So in the church and in your own personal life, there's no room for guilt. There's no room for regret. There's no room for looking back. You, you, you don't have to obligate yourself to, to pay for your sins and, and to, to own your past and to, 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 to feel guilty about that every day and, and what you've done to your kids as a result. You don't, if, you're, if you're a Christ follower, like you're not obligated to live like that any longer. But what's key is you no longer have to feel an obligation to make others pay for their sins either. So, so, so in your family, your mother, your father, your brothers, your cousins, that's not your job to make them pay. That's not your job to hold them accountable. You're not, you're, it's not, God has not given you the, the job of making other people pay for their sins. God has made you rather an agent of grace in this world. Do you know what grace is? Here's one really good definition. Grace is the goodness of God in the life of a sinner. God affords you grace without limit. He just pours it out and he just pours it all over you. And now he's made you an agent of grace that you might do the same thing, that you might dispense grace here in the church first and foremost, at home and then out in the world. A wise person told me this week, every time I say I'll never be like that, I'm living in fear and I'm living in unforgiveness. I'll never be like that, meaning, meaning I don't forgive that person. I don't want to ever be like that person. I'm afraid I'm going to be like that person. You're living in fear and unforgiveness, and God calls us to live in grace, to rest in grace. Instead, I claim the promise that, that Christ has spoken over me. Hear the promise that Christ has spoken over you. You are a new creation in Christ. You're the righteousness of Christ. You, you are filled with the Holy Spirit for a new way of living. That's you. There's a third answer. 
No, I didn't. I just read that. I didn't, didn't project it. Sorry. What does Jesus say about my dysfunction? Answer number three is this. I will, I will live in grace, not fear. Here's what I would say. You need to give yourself a break. You are talking to Christ followers now, talking to Christians, those who have said, I submit my life to Christ. For you, these words are for you. You are harder on yourself now than God is. You expect a level of performance out of yourself that God doesn't expect out of you. Because you're living according to the expectations of the world, that you have to be perfect and that you have to, to meet everyone's standards. And, and, and in contrast, God offers you grace. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he took a position one, at one point in his ministry where he said, I want to be strong. I want to be healthy. I want to have, I don't want to have any, any speech impediments or eye ailments or sickness. I want to be strong. And, and, and Christ said to him, listen, Paul, in your weakness, I am made strong. He said this, he said, oops. He says, Christ said this to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in your weakness. You go home today and, and you're still going to be very, very aware of your own brokenness, your own weakness, your own shortcomings. And what Christ says is, if you'll rest in me, if you'll rest in me, Christ says, I will be made strong right in the midst of your need. You and I often demand it can't be that easy. We can't just rest in Christ. Preachers struggle with that all the time. I got to tell people what to do. If I just tell them to rest in Christ, they're not going to know what to do. I got I to give them some rules. I got to give them some instruction. I got to get them fi five ways to be a better man. Christ invites us to just rest. To rest in his grace and Christ invites us to be agents of grace in one another's lives, to invite you to rest. We, we demand that it can't be that easy. Or there's another position that we often take, and that is one, an arrogant position where I demand that, 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 that I'm my own solution. That's not even a, a Christian ethic by any means. I'm my own solution. I can fix myself. You can fix yourself. That is not the gospel. There's a fourth answer to this question. What did Jesus say about my dysfunction? This it is that I will teach grace to my kids. What does that look like? That looks like this. Da Daddy, uh, Daddy is a mess. Have you ever said that to your kids? Daddy's a mess, and you know it. But I'm just admitting it. Daddy needs Jesus. Some of, the, some of the worst, most dysfunctional homes I have ever seen are led by unrepentant parents. Parents who never admit their own brokenness, never admit their sinfulness, and therefore never admit their need for Jesus. Tell your kids how much you need Jesus. Ad admit your own frailty. Admit your own brokenness. Uh, model repentance for your kids and you'll break sin patterns. You'll break dysfunctional tendencies in their life. So I mess up all the time. I, I, I don't think I'm great at being a dad, but I think I at least model a sense of humility that says, daddy is broken too. I need a savior just like you guys need a savior. Now, many of you, because we have a lot of young adults here, many of you don't have kids. Um, what about the people in your life who are living in dysfunction? Are you super judgmental? Are you like teaching them how to wake up early in the morning and, and go to the gym and, and be super, super disciplined like you? Uh, do you blame them and pity them at the same time? And think that they're lazy or dumb or they just have a, a history of making bad choices. I understand that mindset. But what you need to realize is that 
that your mindset is not in, in line with the teachings of Jesus. What you need to be is an agent of grace in their lives. Afford them all the dignity and patience and mercy and grace that God has afforded you. Back to parents for a moment. This verse, oh, just it just cuts deeply in my heart because I've, I've been here. Fathers, and this is for you mothers too. Fathers, don't provoke your children lest they be discouraged. We're called to be agents of grace in our home, with our kids, at work, with our friends, Christmas time, with our extended family, to speak grace over one another. Now, if, if you haven't gotten um, this truth, if, if it hasn't been ingested, it hasn't, if it hasn't really taken root in your heart, then, then you're living um, in, in fear, in doubt, in anger, maybe in pride. See, see, pride, pride would say, God, "God's God's not really going to help help us, so we got to help ourselves." And and that's 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 deism, man. That's not Christianity, and we're Christians. We're not deists. We're we're Christians. We're not legalists. We're Christians. We're not secularists. We're Christians. That mindset, that mindset of if you just try a little harder and, 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 and work a little more efficiently, man, that speaks into a lot of sociopolitical issues of the day. And what it leads to is a world in which, like, we just eat each other. Right? And... And, 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 and where the, the, the successful become more successful and those in need just have greater needs. But that is not the gospel. So if you're struggling today, if you're living in dysfunction and, and brokenness, uh, maybe the sins of your parents are now your sins. What do you do? I invite you today to come to Jesus. Oh, it can't be that easy. Like, I, I totally understand that. Like, I totally understand that mindset. Because I struggle with secular thinking as well. Like, it couldn't be that easy. We, we got to fix ourselves. I'm just here to tell you that's not the story of the Bible. The gospel of Jesus says this, you come to Jesus. And in your weakness, he'll be made strong. You come to Jesus today. Joseph... We're going to look at him over the next several weeks. Joseph was destined to be just like his dad. And what we will learn in the next few weeks is that God delivered him from that dysfunction, but he did it in tragic and beautiful ways. He did it through really, really dire, difficult times. Maybe you're in a dire and a difficult time right now, and God wants to deliver you. In fact, he's put you there that he might deliver you. I invite you to come to Jesus this morning. I invite you to come to Jesus. Let's pray.